Hey there, folks. Welcome to another edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Today on the program, I have WWE Hall of Famer Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. This is a big one, guys, and hopefully, hopefully, you're listening to this conversation on the way down to WrestleMania or WrestleCon in Dallas, Texas this weekend. And who better to have on the podcast as you make your way down to Dallas this weekend than the man who was a part of quite possibly the best WrestleMania of all time. And quite possibly, and almost undoubtedly, the best WrestleMania match of all time. I couldn't think of a better guest, and I am so, so thankful for Ricky to take time out of his busy day to sit down and have a conversation with me. He said he could only do about 30 minutes, but I sneaked in an extra 10, so I got 40 minutes with a WWE Hall of Famer. And he was very gracious in the sense that he just kind of let me do my own thing. Like the conversation that I had with Ricky is no different than a conversation I would have had with Zane Riley or Nick Alexander, people who are my close and personal friends that I've had on this podcast. And Ricky just kind of let me do my own thing and trusted in where I was going with the conversation and the questions I was asking and everything where we going. And he just kind of, you know, did it and accepted it. And the conversation that we had was just amazing. And he's always been somebody that's inspired me to do better and do good and hopefully those who are listening to this podcast, he does that for you, and this podcast does the same for you as it did for me. Just, what an amazing guy. I, can't, I keep going on and on about him, and I can't thank him enough because quite possibly he's the most high-profile guest I've had on this podcast. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've talked to the sitting mayor of Charlotte. I've had former Major League player, baseball player Jeff Schaefer. I've had former NFL player Jeff Reed. I have had Dr. Frank Gaskill, uh, Kelly from the Charlotte Comedy Theater. I've had JP from Birdsong Brewery and multiple breweries on this podcast. But when I say all these names, especially for people who are probably in my audience, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat probably rings the truest of all those names and strikes your, your earlobes the hardest in a sense. Like, oh, I want to listen to that one. But Anybody that's just showing up today, I highly recommend that you go back in my back catalog and look at, at all the interesting people that I've had conversations with over for the over the past year or so. I mean, if this was the, the lightning rod that brought you to the, the cool kids table, as I call it, well, welcome to it. You know, there's plenty of people sitting here. There's plenty of room for you at the cool kids table. Jump on board. Uh, don't mind the guy over there that's sniffing glue. We don't judge people at the cool kids table. We just kind of let you be. But... I'm just saying, we've got a lot of people sitting at the table, and it's nice to, that you might want to go check everybody out. So that's what I'm saying. Just look at the back catalog. We got a lot of good interviews in the can, you know. So just check them out. And thanks for coming by. Also, too, big thank you to Shining Wizards Podcast Network. You know, they could have just waited for me to have a high-profile guest like Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and then been like, "Hey, we want to do business with you. We want to work with you." No, no. They came in almost at the ground floor. They're like, hey, we hear what you're doing. We like what you got going on. We want to be a part of the cool kids table. I'm like, sure, come on over. And hey, can I be a part of your cool kids table? I'm like, sure. So we just pulled two tables together. And that's pretty much the partnership I have with Shining Wizards Network. And they've got a lot of good people over there. And I highly recommend that you check them out at shiningwizardsnetwork.com. Anyways, let me throw you some dates right now before we get too much further into this intro and further into this conversation. I've only got a couple. I'm not going to take too much long. Uh, mostly, I just want to remind you, WrestleCon this weekend, Friday and Saturday, April 1st and 2nd in Dallas at the downtown Hyatt Regency. We're going to have all kinds of events, all kinds of live events, meet and greets, autograph sessions, Q&As. Everything's going to be going on WrestleCon weekend, excuse me, uh, during WrestleMania weekend. It's very confusing right now. But just know that WrestleCon is the best possible complement to WrestleMania weekend. So if you're already down there just kind of knocking around going, hey, we kind of did access. We kind of walk around. We're trying to find something to do before the Hall of Fame starts or, you know, we just don't know what to do in Dallas. Well, guess what? WrestleCon is your answer, WrestleMania weekend. So, like I said, at the Downtown Hyatt Regency, for more information about WrestleCon, you could log on to WrestleCon.com. Also, one more date to give to you is Sunday, April 17th, 
PWX returns to Charlotte, North Carolina at Escapade, just off of Independence Boulevard, just in the shadow of the old Charlotte Coliseum, where Ricky used to have some of his most famous matches for Jim Crockett promotions back in the day. So uh, for more information about that show, make sure you log on to pwxpro.com. Um, I'm probably going to have a lot of things come up in April, a lot of comedy, a lot of improv, and the best way to know about upcoming shows is basically to follow me on social media, and that's very easy to do. All you have to do is you just have to follow me on Twitter, at Manscout Manning, and on Instagram, at Manscout Manning. If you have a question about the podcast, or if you want to become a sponsor of this podcast, make sure you email me at jake at sslshow.com. Or if you want to book from your upcoming wrestling event, make sure you email me at manscoutmanning at yahoo.com. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into this interview with WWE Hall of Famer, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, here on Stranger in a Southern Land. Yeah, I can hear okay, you great. Good. I've got your your levels right here. Okay. Start to wander. So, but just gonna jump right into it. Uh, I always do an intro, but we'll just go. Make your intro. Make no. Yeah. I do. I do it separately. And I we just we have it's all this is a conversation. Okay. You know we're just gonna talk and you know because I it's very nice to see you these days. I, you know we, you know I've been seeing you a lot recently because you're doing the tour. You know meet and greets and stuff like that and a yeah. lot of these events and stuff like that. Well, you know I've got Tony Hunter. Uh, which a guy you know. Yes. I've known Tony since the mid-90s, and um, uh, still working with the WWE. Yeah. And I'm more like a uh, diplomat, spokesperson. Um, I do appearances for them, and, uh, and then I can freelance, and uh, that's why I'm here today, um, you know, doing this for you, and, yeah, uh, and also uh, making an appearance out here at the show, at, the, at one of the local venues. Yeah, and yeah. Like we're in the basement of basically a college gym, which, you know, how many basement of high school and college gyms have you been in over your long career? Well, Jake, you know, <laughs> you know, I would say, you know, back in the 80s when I was working, in the late 70s, early 80s, when I was working for Crocker Promotions, mm-hmm. almost a third of all the cities and towns and venues that we ventured to were in places like this. Yeah. You know, one third. Of course, you had Greensboro Coliseum, Charlotte, and Richmond, and all that. But you know, the places that we would we would go to, uh, a lot of them were like this. And I remember Jim Crockett. You know, he told me he said, "Ricky, you got to take the little ones with the big ones." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I always, um, you know, you brought up Jim Crockett and stuff like that. Like when I think about your career and stuff like that, I always think, yeah, everybody talks about you and Flair, of course. But like something that I don't think gets talked about a lot of those early matches with you and Flair, like, I, like um, those, I think it was like the 70s or the early 80s, like before... 1977. Yes, the, in the late 70s. That was like, the first time him and I hooked up. Yeah, like I don't, think, I don't think those matches get enough play for what they are because I feel like that those matches were really something... Well, you know, you know, Jay, you know uh, this, is, this is the honest God truth uh, mm-hmm. coming from me. Um, I know I've, I've, I've watched him, but the first time I watched him was... A long time ago, and I'm thinking that it was in the 70s, mm-hmm. late 70s, when I, I watched a replay of them. And then I recently just got brought up to speed about watching them maybe about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And my opinion of me watching them a year ago mm-hmm. was a lot different than watching me 30, 40 years ago. How so? Well, I thought my work, and this is me talking now, mm-hmm. well, oh my God, I was terrible. Really? <laughs> I was, t- my selling, <laughs> oh God, was very rigid. Um, some, some points in time of the match, I, I tried to look like I was fluent, and other points I looked like very robotic. Um, you know, I, just picking myself apart, so... Um, you know, thank you. You know, thank you. Uh, you know. Uh, well, I, th- I think the thing that I always I was took very away- green. Yeah, but you know? I always the thing I always took away from is you guys were doing a lot of like like high spots and moving things and keeping the action moving. Yeah. Where a lot of the matches at the time were big, lumbery guys and and, and the way wrestling. You know, right. there was a lot of wrestling of that going on. But you guys are really young guys going out there and getting it. And it seems like every generation there's always that 
younger talent that's you know, doing a lot of high spots and pushing the sport and the art form forward. Well, you know, at the same time, yeah, yeah, obviously you want to go out there and show everybody that uh, you are a wrestler, but you're an athlete. Yeah. And you're able to do uh, the things that we did. Um, we ha had to show everybody that we were in good shape. Because um, as you know, and it doesn't happen so much today, that a lot of the main event matches, you know, went 30, 40 minutes. And there was, there was times in which uh, uh, Flair and I would wrestle for the 60-minute draw. You know, t the time would expire. That's when they would have time limits on all the matches. Mm -hmm. Maybe the opening match of the evening would have a 15-minute time limit. Mm -hmm. Then it would segue to 20, 25 as the matches got deeper into the show. But every match after intermission was always 60 minutes. And I love the fact that there was time limits. You know, because uh, you could play with that uh, as you're, as you're uh, orchestrating your match with the fans. Mm -hmm. You know, especially Flair and I, when the announcers say 50 minutes, 10 minutes left, you know, mm -hmm. 55 minutes gone, five minutes left. Well, then you knew there was a little bit of anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, then the fans would get worked up. And, of course, Flair, I mean, um, um, yeah, Flair being the champion and Steamboat always chasing him. And I've got, like, three minutes left on a 60 minute match to try and beat this guy. And I got two minutes, I got one minute, I got 30 seconds, you know. So um, I think it would add a lot of the drama uh, back then. But, you know, once again, they, they don't do time limits today. Yeah, it's just like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Just, you know, a couple spots to get in Well, and that out. was another thing, you know. We took, uh, took a lot of pride in telling a story, mm -hmm. you know, in the course of the, of the match. And whether it be, um, um, a wounded body part that you were always trying to get back to. And that, that would be the picture that you would paint. And that would be, um, you know, if I was working on Flair's arm, because, you know, I had Ricky Steamboat and his arm drags, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then Flair has the upper hand for uh, 10 or 15 minutes of the match. But during that time, I would always express myself to try and get back to that arm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he would heal mm -hmm. his way out of it and, and then get back on top. But the story would be that can Ricky get back to that arm because everybody knows I, I, I beat up on it pretty good and did a good job on it. Um, storytelling today, I think, is almost like a lost art. Yeah. You know, you still have guys today that can do it, such as your Triple H's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Shawn Michaels, the Undertakers, and all those guys. You know, they, uh, you know, premier guys on being able to tell a story in the course of a match. But I, I hope it's something that does, does go that does not go away forever because uh, to me, if you're able to tell a good story in a match, that it's, it's one, of the, one of the few things that I think, regardless of your character, regardless of uh, how athletic you are, because you know, Jake, there's a lot of guys back in the business that were not very athletic. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna bring up a name. You know, God bless him, he passed away a few months ago, Dusty Rhodes. Now, Dusty was not a very athletic guy. He did not do a lot of leapfrogs. He did not do a lot of jumping up and down, drop down, you know. He'd, he'd throw an occasional drop kick or something like that. Mm -hmm. But his, his charisma uh, and the way he could uh, project himself talking on the mic, but then the story that he could tell in the course of his match, you know, um, we always made him one of the top main event guys in our business. Yeah, for sure. And you, you were a top guy multiple yeah. times in your career, and, and also too, you took a lot of time for family. Like, I always remember seeing a lot of, like, magazine articles, like Ricky yeah. Steamboat at his gym, taking yeah. his time with his family. What were, why did you, why was family so important well, to you? you know, a long time, well, early in my career, which was a long time ago, uh, I've been doing this for over 40 plus years. Um, I had an old timer tell me, you know, he said, uh, well, one of the things he was trying to express to me was, uh, he emphasized save your money. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy that's been in the business for 25 years, and the reason why he's still doing it is because he's trying to put his kids through college. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's continued working. Yeah. Um, but he also did express to me that it's amazing how fast time goes by, and he now realizes that he's in the twilight of his career, and he's putting his kids through uh, college, and he really doesn't hardly know them that well. And it's because he was working 300 plus days a year on the road, gone. So one of the things, one of the other things he emphasized to me is that, you know, don't forget your family because the next thing you know, you're going to be um, 25 years into your career working and putting a, your son through college and you don't even hardly know him, mm -hmm. you know. So 
uh, when I had my firstborn and my only, uh, Richie, and which <laughs> you've worked with him, oh, you yeah. know him, yeah. um, as he was coming up through the years, I tried as a father to spend as much time with him and get involved with all his sports. He played football, he played baseball, he, he did uh, AAU wrestling, he got into racing cars, you know, and then later in life, and then he segued into um, actually doing, um, doing what we do. Mm -hmm. He got hurt and he's unable to do it now. But in getting back, I do remember the words from you know, that old time wrestlers did. Um, and then there was times throughout my career in which I got my family involved, maybe making an appearance with me on the way to the ring. But always remember the family values and that uh, time uh, passes by so fast. I look back at it now and I say, how the hell did 40 years go by? How, how did it go by? You know, it's like a snap of a finger. You know, so um, I did remember that and, uh, and, and, and spent so much, as much time as I possibly could, devoted time. There was times that I would break away from the business for six months just so I could spend time with the family. Mm -hmm. You know, so help, hope, hope that answers your question. No, it yeah. abs absolutely does. I've always, always wondered that because, like, you've always been the constant family man. And like I said, you would go away between, yeah. like, you know, and I always wondered why that was because most guys' thought process is get, get out there, make as much money as I can, hurry you know, up and as, do what I can. Because yeah, as, as you're, you're on a time stamp as a yeah, pro wrestler. Yeah. You know, like, you, you're, you can only your, do your this for so long. Your career goes here, here, and, and, that, that's, 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 and you've got to make the best of it. Well, I think I did make the best of it, but then there were segments to which I would, I'd have to take a break. Yeah. You know, my family up. was very, very important to me. Very yeah. important to me. Yeah. I mean, after all the wrestling is going to be gone, mm -hmm. what's going to be left? Yeah. It's your, your family. Your family. Yeah. Right. And then, and you know, what are you doing it for, you know, at the end of the day? But also, too, you know, you, you were very active in, in Richie's pro wrestling career and I think yeah. you guys even like I think teamed together in Puerto Rico one time yes we did like, what was that like you know because you just started wrestling again you know mm -hmm. and, and then you started wrestling with your son tell me what that was like because when I my father has a similar experience my dad was big in fast fish softball and I was good enough to play you know baseball enough and then I got to play fast pitch softball with my right. father and share the outfield with him my dad said that's one of my proudest moments of all time sure. but you guys had to do that on a much larger scale at a wrestling show well and, you, you know, know you know Zach regardless of the, the Jake regardless of the the scale um, I just wanted to be able to have a match that I said one time before I really bowed out of the business and I'm, I'm physically unable to do what I'd like, what I want to do in the ring, and that is to have a match with my son. And my son, at the same time, said, "Dad, I, I want to get good en enough to which, there'll, hopefully, there'll be a time left to which I can have a match with my dad." Mm -hmm. You know, and that 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 did come about mm -hmm. um, uh, down in Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. And well, what was that like? What was that feeling? You know, we have we have the match on tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was it? Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. It's and it only happened once, mm -hmm. but at least we said we were able to do it, father, son. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to say, you know, it ranks up on the, you know, there's a lot of things that, I, that has happened in my life. You know, being a world champion, having the match with Savage at WrestleMania three, which they talk about, the trilogy matches that I had with Ric Flair, um, you know, becoming the dragon and morphing into that character. Um, but, you know, the, I have to put, you know, having a match with my son that got no publicity hardly other than maybe down in Puerto Rico. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was on a big national television. No. It wasn't a pay-per-view or anything like that. But being able to say one time that, you know, we were in the ring together as a tag team, father and son, uh, speaks volumes. And it, it meant a lot to me. And it puts it right up there in the class of all my championship matches that I've had in my past. Yeah. You know, and you've always been, throughout your career, like, I think sometimes there's a, there's a disconnect from your generation to our generation because a lot of people from your generation, a lot of guys, you know, were ex-football players or they couldn't make it here or they saw pro wrestling's way to make money. Yeah. Where a lot of people my age grew up watching people like yourself right. and wanting to emulate and do that, and we we think very much about the craft and we're, we'd rather have more. We'd rather have like an amazing match on WrestleMania than a million dollar payday. But you've always been a guy that's cared cared very much about the in-ring product and the quality. 
Yeah. Well, where does that come from from you? Like, why? why I, you well, I'm, I'm going to tell you where it comes from. It comes from my dad being retired military and my mother being from Japan. Um, the, and saying that mother, my mother being from Japan, those people are very, very respectful people. Very, very respectful. And she taught me almost uh, in every way, every shape or form of life that uh, you need to be able to respect it. Um, understand. And my, then my dad being on the military side, also teaching uh, respect. But you know, in saying so, um, there, 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 there are two different categories. The respect that my, my father was teaching me and the respect that my mother was teaching me. Mm -hmm. you know? um, what was the difference? Well, you? I'm thinking the respect that, um, that my dad was teaching me is more in front of the eyes of everybody watching, mm -hmm. okay? Um, people watching how you react. Um, if you're yes or no, sir, if you shake hands, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's people that can see. Um, and, and my dad has told me this, you know, all his, uh, I have two other brothers and all, he said, all your sons are very, very respectful, you know, and it's because of the upbringing. Now, the respect that my mother was teaching me, and I don't know if you'll understand this, but um, this, is a, this is a respect that comes from the heart mm -hmm. that nobody sees. You know, but it's what you feel. You know, I could put on a persona mm -hmm. of being respectful to somebody, which everybody can see, and, all right? Mm -hmm. But the respect that my mother was teaching me is something that I felt in my heart. That's the kind of respect that I was giving in the ring. It came from my heart. So that is why every time I got in the ring, I always wanted the finished product. Uh, to be the best that I could do, be with uh, whoever I was that that given night. Mm -hmm. that, that came from my heart. You, you sort of see the difference. Yeah, I can see that. There's a respect that everybody can see, and that's a visual thing to which they can see how respectful you are. Mm -hmm. But then the respect that my mother was teaching me was the, the respect everything was coming from the inside. You re, give me an example. You, you respect the way that the butterfly goes for them the uh, cocoon to the butterfly, the way the flower blossoms and opens up, mm -hmm. okay? And, and the feeling that you get in watching that transformation, that feeling comes from your heart. Yeah. You know? And, um, and you respect it. You said, oh my God, it just, it, it, more, it went from this to this. So, um, and, and to this day, I'm very respectful even uh, to all our wrestling fans. Uh, I will show it from the outside, but it also comes from my heart. I'm very thankful for all that they've, um, all the support they've given me over the years. There's a lot of things I've, I've had and accumulated, and if it wasn't for the fans that, uh, um, that came and bought a ticket to watch me, you know, I've got a beautiful home, um, car, you know, everything that I have, uh, once again, there was a, there, you know, there's a lot of hard labor put involved in it. You've seen the matches that I've been in and the time that I put in my, with my matches, you know. Um, but once again, if it wasn't for the fans, we, none of us would be here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another thing, not just the fans, you've always been very respectful of people that you've, you've been on shows with, just like a similar show like today. You're just doing an appearance. You could come in, do uh, you know autographs, pictures, yeah. all that stuff, and then you could just kind of hang out at your table, not really pay attention to the matches, but you've always... I almost feel bad that I'm pulling you away right now for this interview <laughs> because I know you want to be probably watching the matches, sure. get, pull somebody aside, give somebody advice. Where does that come from? Because, I mean, you've paid your debt. You've paid yeah. your debt to the sport, but what makes you feel like you need to keep paying it forward? Um, because I had it happen to me early in my career. And what I mean by that is I had a lot of other wrestlers in Ricky Steamboat's first couple of years of being in the business that would take the time, they didn't have to, watch my match, and after my match, call me over in the corner, give me a few pointers, maybe some things not to do, maybe if you did it this way, it might be better to do, but they would take the time and critique my matches, which then, uh, I would then hopefully apply it the next night and get better, okay, so it's just paying it forward, doing this, doing what was already, that helped me out. Hopefully I can help somebody else out, mm -hmm. you know. 
And, and I feel like right now, especially at this independent level, it's probably the best it's ever been. There's a lot of forward progression. There's a lot of guys moving up, a lot of guys moving down and helping other people. Yeah. Do you see it the same way? Do you yes. feel like this level right now is yes. probably the best it's been? You know, right now, um, guys like me who were able to get in the ring and work with the up-and-coming generation that could help them along are, um, we're getting few. Mm -hmm. We're getting few. Um, the art and craft of our sport, uh, I hope we do not lose. And um, being able to tell a good story in the course of your match, instead of just filling it with nothing but nonstop high spots, you know, boom to boom to boom to boom. There's really no story in that. Um, it's it. The direction is going that way, but I hope that somewhere down the line that we will still have a number of guys that are able to pull it back a little bit and say, look, you want to be different than the guy that went out there and did um, 20 high spots in a seven minute match? Mm -hmm. You know, you can, and if you're able to tell a story, you know, um, this, is, this is the art form that I hope we never lose. Absolutely. Um, but it, and I'm sure you, you agree that it seems to be going in that non-stop action. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like someone like me is getting much older. It's very hard to keep up with. Yeah. Just well, even you know, the 20 I always tell today. the guys, I said, you know, you, you just put a 10-minute match in a, in a six-minute match, mm -hmm. you know, which doesn't make sense. There's a lot of stuff you could have exonated and taken out of that match, which you, you didn't really need to do. And the fans wouldn't have missed it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and then why are you doing it? You know, and once again, it's not helping you tell your story, you know. So, what was uh, a rest, an old timer told me one time? If you think you're going slow, mm -hmm. go slower. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But you talk about these great stories, and, and since I, I, I'm sitting here talking to you, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up, of course, you know, the match with. Uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, WrestleMania 3. Yeah. But, like, everybody still talks about that today. And I've always felt like for quite some time, like, WWE was trying to get a match that was just as good as that, that might be, you know, with somebody contemporary. You know, it seems like they've tried to push, oh, this could be the match that'll be just as good as Steamboat. And, well, you know, and, like uh, when they mashed up Shawn Michaels and Undertaker yeah. at that WrestleMania. I mean, that was a hell of a match. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, there, there's been good yeah. ones, but it seems like there's been a lot of them they've pushed well, you know, to be that you good. You know what? We, I, were, we were different. Yeah, like, I just want to know, what, why does that still stand we were the different. test of time? You know, we had 21 false finishes in a 17-minute match. That means we were trying to cover uh, each other in, like, every 45 seconds. <laughs> Which the story there is, is that we're, actually, we're fighting for a championship. He's trying to hold on to it, and I'm trying to win it, you know? And the only way you can throw that out there in the story is trying to beat the man. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize there was that many pinfalls in it. Yeah. That is true. And that makes sense. If, I think if people just even made that probably small adjustment to the way they wrestle, they'd probably... You know, that's what made it... Because typically you'd have your, your match in which uh, during the beginning the baby face would have his uh, moment and uh, his shine. And yeah. maybe have a, a one or two covers and kicks out. Mm -hmm. Then you segue into the heat and the heel would be beaten up in the baby face and maybe get three or four covers. Mm -hmm. And then you're uh, towards the end of the match in which uh, you have your comeback and maybe a couple of false finishes there. And then uh, the outcome, whoever, the bad guy gets his Duke raised or the good guy. So all in all, when you add it up, you might have seven or eight, you know, nine finishes, false finishes in the course of a, a standard match. Mm -hmm. Well, when Savage and I had 21 in 17 minutes, everybody just said, oh, my God. And the crowd was with each one. Mm -hmm. And we got to the point that they were just, it was going back and forth so much that they were thinking, oh, God, who's, who can win this? So what it boiled down to, the concept in which I think we got across was, oh, wow, what a championship match. We made it a championship match, knowing that we were, you know, Hogan and, and, and Andre were after us. And that was the big talk of the town. That was the big ticket. Yeah, I remember you saying something that, like you knew that that was going to sell the tickets. And like, we have to make sure that this match, you well, know. Randy and I want to steal the show. Yeah. Yeah, we heard, you know, ticket sales were going through the roof at the Silverdome. Mm -hmm. uh, 70,000. What, what, what made you think like that as opposed to, oh, I'm going to get a big payday? Well, um, 
Because you could have took that right. You could be like, oh, we're going to get a good payday. Let's just do this match or whatever. But no, you decided, like, no, no I want I, something memorable. No, both Randy and I understood, let's take advantage of this situation. We heard the buy rate was, the, the pay-per-view was going very well. The ticket sales at the Silverdome, 70, 80, 90,000, you know, it was going off the hook. Mm -hmm. um, with that much coverage, we, let's take advantage of the situation. I also knew Andre very well, and he was back was bad, his hips were bad, and they were going to do, you know, bear hug, very... So you got to give the fans something. Well, uh, it's not so much the, okay, the ball's, uh, you know, the show is on our shoulders and mm -hmm. we need to, you know, save the show. It wasn't that. We actually wanted to, to steal the show. Mm -hmm. And we set forth to steal the night and put together something totally different, you know. It could have been, you know, because you know leading up to that match, it was a Savage came off the top rope with the bell on my throat, and everybody's thinking that Ricky Steamboat's going to get redemption, and he's going to hurt Savage and, 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 and beat him up and, and hurt his throat or something like that, which would be the obvious storyline. But I told Randy, and it's not because he brought that up. This We were both thinking on the same page. This is what the public's going to think. Yeah. But I told Randy, I think that what we need to make it is make it all about the championship. And um, with that in mind, make it a championship match, which then I think down the road will, will speak volumes. You know, it wasn't that, oh, yeah, Ricky would have went out there and tried to hurt his throat. It's only because that's what everybody's thinking. Because mm -hmm. they may not remember that backstory years right. from later. You're thinking that somebody's going to see this. And it's interesting that we you... We want them to remember the match. Yeah. The match. What will make the match? And I think the best thing is that we make the match a championship match. And the only way you make it a championship match is who's trying to beat who here. Absolutely. And, and we just just drilled it. Yeah, and you could yeah. put that match in a time capsule and then leave it for 40 years and then bring it out and like, here, this is what pro wrestling well, is, I, you know? Well, and people still yeah. look back at it today and yeah. it still holds up. Yeah, well, thank you. But uh, there's a lot of guys that come after that, you know, the next generation of guys that follow that, that became great workers mm -hmm. say that that match is what helped turn their thought process around you know mm -hmm. going forward the Bret Hart's and the Shawn Michaels and you know they were saying, wow you know instead of your standard seven eight uh, false finishes and then you have a pinfall these you guys went out there in 21 and number 22 which was picked me up for a slam and I just hung on for a small package. It's a, it wasn't about Ricky doing the dive off the top mm -hmm. or, or, or Randy coming off the top with his elbow. You know, yeah. that was his finish, right? His elbow off yeah. the top rope. At that point in time with so many false finishes, any finish that would have probably, that would have gotten the one, two, three would have blown the roof off. And we took the small package, which was, uh, so used in our business for a false finish and prostituted as so mm -hmm. that to verify what I'm saying is that what made the match was all the false finishes and then the fans were guessing which false finish it is it going to be to finally for someone to get the one two three yeah and we took the simplest one in the book the oldest one in the book a small package to give us the one, two, three. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, the small package in the midst of false finishes is the most yeah. beautiful tool you could have. Yes. It, it just, you set up for something and then there right it is. Yeah. I think more people- Nobody would have thought it's no small package. Yeah, it, 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 that's the thing is you Nobody. pull that out. And well, and that's the reason why we went with it because yeah. we, you try to do something the fans aren't calling. Oh, yeah. here goes Ricky off the top rope with his cross body, this is it. Uh, you know. I don't know if it would add any flavor to it because the guys are doing it today. Yeah. I don't know if it's adding any flavor to it if the guys are doing it today. And that is, if um, if I would have come off the top rope with my dive, mm -hmm. and we got a one two and Randy kicked out of it, mm -hmm. one of the holy moments. Yeah, yeah. Which is done a, a lot. A lot now. Yeah, a lot. Um. I don't know. And if Randy came off the top with his elbow on me and covered me and it was a one, two and a half and I came out of it. Yeah. You know? Knowing that if we would have done that back then, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it would have even raised the bar for the match. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, this guy has come out of the other guy's best maneuver. 
who is going to win this thing, and we catch them with a small package. Well, you had to leave something for the kids to do. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't take it all in one match, yeah. or else we could just stop wrestling forever. You guys would have nailed it. But, um, you know, I, I know you don't have a lot of time, but I, I definitely want to get to this topic. And this okay. is a topic that, I, and I want to leave enough time for it, because okay. I think you're the perfect person to talk about this. Because part of the reason why I started this podcast is as I want to, because I don't just have wrestlers on. I've interviewed the mayor of Charlotte. I've interviewed brewers. I've interviewed psychologists, uh, writers. Really? Director, all kinds of people. Really? It's not just the wrestling podcast. Yeah. But the people that I have on are, are successful in varying degrees. Right. And... I basically want to sit down and talk with, with you and what, how do you define success? Is it, you know, do you see yourself as successful? Do you feel like success is something that you can achieve? Or how do you, what's the mindset do you have to have to achieve it? I just want to talk about success in general and maybe probably what pops in your head when I say that word. You know, a lot of people look at successful people and and it's, and. And the reason why that person is successful is maybe all the um, materialistic things they own. Mm. The big house on the hill, right? They're yeah. driving the fast, fancy cars, mm. you know, the jewelry that they wear. Um, my question is that if you take that all away from that person, is that person not as successful? No, not really. Because on the other, the, the, on the flip side of it, you do have the people that are very, very successful, yet they don't flash it. Right? Yeah. You know? Uh, was it still money in a sense? Is it not flashing it, but is it still the security of it? Well, you know, there's a lot of guys that, not a lot, but that, you know, um, um, you hear stories of some guys living up in the woods in Nashville in the cabin and, and, and not knowing that he was the founder of some kind of uh, um, um, uh, television sparked. Uh, genius. He was an engineer at DuPont yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, he's worth $25 million, but he, yeah. he lives very, very plain and simple. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so does he fall into the category of not being successful? No. You know, to, um, it's not, I don't, you know, once again, it's not the materialistic things, although there's a lot of people that do think that way because that person has got all that, you know, he must be wealthy. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, success is where you wear it on your, sh on your sleeve. Um, I feel that I've been very successful. Um, I've been through some marriages. Um, there's been times I've had to start over. Um, but on each time that I started over, I knew um, the right direction that I had to go to get back where I needed to be. Um, I have a house in Florida. It's not a big house. House was made in 1958, makes it over a half century old. I refurbished it, but I own it, you know. Um, my vehicles, I own them. I don't flash a lot. You look, I wear a $100 G-Shock watch, okay? Uh -huh. um, a little piece here that my, my, the girl that I'm seeing um, gave me. Mm -hmm. Um, I wear the, my Hall of Fame ring, which is... Which you should. <laughs> which, as I should and, and do, it's the most um, prized uh, materialistic piece that I own, mm -hmm. this Hall of Fame ring. That sort of put the icing on the cake on my career. You know, you, bec you want to become a champion. Back in the day, real quick, back in the day, yeah. you want to become a champion. And back in the day, it was always like regional. You know, they had Florida champion, Georgia champion, the Mid-Atlantic champion. And then, of course, you had the NWA champion that was a champion over all those territories. And, you know, in your career, you wanted to see if you could be a main event guy. And then you wanted to see if you could be a champion. Then if you wanted to see if you could be a world champion. But, um, you know, this, this sort of just signifies that... Um, to me that all your peers and all the different championships that were floating around it, um, uh, you, you, made, uh, you made a Hall of Fame. Uh, there's, and there's another Hall of Fame that I'm involved with too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, yep. yeah, up in New York. Yes. But, uh, but getting, back, getting back to success, I think um, a person, I, I don't really give a damn on whether people look at me and think that if Ricky Steamboat has ever been successful, mm -hmm. I really don't care uh, for their opinion. I know where I've been, 
and I know that I've made mistakes in my past and I've tried to overcome. I know I've had marriages in the past that have failed and overcome. And where I'm at now at the age of 63, I look back on the things that I've been able to overcome and achieve. On my sleeve, I feel I've been successful. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's say you don't get that Hall of Fame ring. Yes. But you have everything else. Right. But you don't have that Hall of Fame accolade for whatever. Do you still see yourself as a success? Yes. You still wear that on your sleeve? Yes. And I'll tell you why. I never thought I was going to get the Hall of Fame ring. Mm -hmm. It was a surprise to me that when John Laronitis told me that I was going to be inducted, I was not losing sleep over the fact that um, why have I not gotten the phone call? Mm -hmm. Because it was in 2009 and I was re uh, retired, retired from um, uh, in 1994, you know, so here we're talking 15 years later. You know, yeah. so um, I, I wasn't brooding over it. To me, it, yeah, it would it would be the one thing that you'd like to have in your trophy case that sort of caps everything off. But um, I I know what I've done in my career. You know what I've done in my career. Everybody A lot of the has. guys out there that um, weren't even born yet, but know now what I've done in my career, mm -hmm. um, and how I like to give back. And I don't do that with, uh, with, th with a thought process of, oh my, you know, I have to do it, or m maybe because I'm doing it because I feel guilty. Mm -hmm. No, it's, I do it because I want to do it, and because the people that helped me early in my career, they wanted to help me. So I, I, I'm just passing it forward that way. But I, I wear my success um, on my sleeve, and what I mean by that, um, Jake, is I, I wear it in my heart. Because I know in my heart, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of guys in the business that made a ton more money than me, and that's fine and dandy. But uh, it's fun to have them come up to me and, and give me the yes or no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I bet. Yeah. But uh, yeah, real, real uh, briefly too. Like you, you talk about like you know just even adversity. How do you deal with like failures and and and. and the, the tough times and the hard times. What's the mental thought process? Because you are a success. Nobody, yeah. nobody denies that. But it's. I feels like to me that to be. I'm very strong spiritually. Spiritually, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. And I'll tell you when. And um, I've always believed in God, but I got real serious about making Him a big part of my life when I turned 50. That was 13 years ago. I got baptized. So uh, I guess they say, you know, most times you do a baptism. It's Mm -hmm. uh, during the infant or child yeah. years. Uh, um, I just wanted to be baptized. I wanted to be saved. I wanted to know that when I pass that I will be going to heaven. And it was the same time I baptized Richie. Oh. We got it father and son together. He was about 15 mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and from that point on, um, I don't, I don't like to push my belief out yeah. on, on to people, but I will not hesitate that if they um, want to share a discussion, then I'm there for that. Um, I know it's made me a better person. It's made me better, uh, Jake, in the form of giving back, you know, because that's the way Jesus and God has wanted you to do. Um, so that's why you may, you see me more doing this more now than let's say prior to when I was 50, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it, 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 I've always, uh, not late, not always, but lately I've been more on, um, I, there's a question I always um, put in the back of my mind that, any kind of situation that would come up, and I hope and I pray each day that I do this more often. And yeah. I actually, I actually pray for this each day. And that is, um, if situations come up, what would Jesus do if He was sitting on my shoulder? What if, you know, what if He was sitting right there? So before I make a um, road rage <laughs> event, yeah, take a moment and think about that. And it, um, many, many times it, it has saved me. Um, 
from, from doing the stupid things and, and regretting later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're not going to see Ricky Steamboat getting in a bar fight <laughs> at this age. You know, I, you know, if a guy hits you, hits you first, I don't know what, to, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> you know, but I always try to diplomatically say, look, we don't need to do this. Okay, mm -hmm. we don't need to do this, yeah. especially at my age. What if I got to prove? <laughs> you know, end up on TMZ. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. you haven't done that yet. That's one of the few things you haven't done. Right. <laughs> It's not on my bucket list. <laughs> well, anyways, Ricky, you've been very gracious with your time. Um, before we get out of here, yeah. is there anything else that you'd like to share? We, you know, get out there to the fans that listen to this podcast. You'd like to say to them. Oh my goodness! You know, if everybody out there, um, everybody has uh, maybe a different meaning of uh, the definition of love. Mm -hmm. And um, I love my business. I love my work. You know, I love God. And um, I, one thing that, uh, and this is going back to fam family values, is everybody out there, try and find somebody to share that with. You know, um, you, you, may ha you may have a, a few hit and misses, and which I have. Yeah. But, you know, never stop trying to find that special person to share it with. Because it is a lot better to be sharing it with somebody than it is to be doing it alone. You know, that makes a big difference Absolutely. in one's life. Yeah. That's all I got. All right. Well, Ricky, thank you very yeah. much for your time. Appreciate it. All right.